In the sport of model aviation, there's a category known as control line. Quite simply, this is a category of models that fly in a circle on the ends of thin steel wires or cables. Control is exerted by the flyer who stands in the middle of the flight circle holding a U-shaped handle from which one or more lines go to the model to provide up and down elevator, engine speed, and other controls. Shortly before World War II, an inventor fastened a set of wires and a control mechanism to a model airplane. Thus began the sport of U-control or control line model aircraft flying. Since then, Advances in methods and style, as well as the creation of various types of competition within the control line category, have made this one hobby that's wired for excitement. Of all the categories in the world of control line flying, none is as poetic as that of precision aerobatics. There is such grace and grandeur in this area of the sport that there can be little argument when these flyers and their planes are called the sky painters. Precision aerobatics, also called stunt, is one of the more popular events. In it, the pilot demonstrates his ability to perform with precision a set pattern of difficult maneuvers such as the reverse wing over, the hourglass, square horizontal eights, the four-leaf clover, and others. In competition, scoring in the stunt event is based on the appearance of the model and the precision with which the maneuvers are performed. Appearance points are given for craftsmanship and excellence of finish. But more important than looks is the way the pilot and his plane paint their undulating patterns on the electric blue canvas of the sky. Under the critical eye of the judges, each stroke in the portrait is graded. And when the painting is finished, the painter may not have won, but he also knows he hasn't lost, because beauty is in the eye of the beholder and in the joy of participation. And while some men paint, other men sew. These are the needle threaders. The event is called Navy Carrier, and it has gained steadily in popularity since it was first held in competition at the Nationals in Dallas, Texas in 1950. The basic idea is to have scale or semi-scale models simulate full-scale carrier operations, including an arrested landing aboard a model carrier deck. The model plane duplicates the performance of full-size carrier craft by flying a high-speed phase, followed by a low-speed run, and then landing. While the 44-foot-long carrier deck may look like a large target, landing a speeding mini-plane on its surface can be quite abrupt and is about as easy as threading the eye of a needle from 60 feet away.
Scoring depends on four factors. Scale fidelity, high speed, low speed, and landing. What gives the various categories of Navy carrier a little touch of drama is that the area surrounding the deck is considered as water. If the plane touches it during the flight, it is considered to have crashed and the official flight is terminated. It is easy to see that excellent flying ability and good dexterity are required by all the pilots who compete in this event. Perhaps in no other event are those thin steel wires of communication between pilot and plane so important. They are the umbilical cord of sensation that will make the difference for the pilot between dumping his plane in the imaginary drink and bringing it in safely onto the narrow deck. While there are subtleties in Navy carrier, flyers in the speed category have one aim, flat out streak of lightning speed, for these are the merchants of zip. Several factors contribute to making these planes go fast, including the pilot, engine, whether it be piston or jet powered, fuel, plane design, and weather conditions. Speeds range up to 200 miles per hour or more. The planes used in speed are unique to this event. They are characterized by extreme streamlining, strength, and ruggedness. Nothing is added other than essential components, and even the wheels drop away upon takeoff. In order to get these tuned engines roaring properly, many flyers make innovative modifications to squeeze every fraction of a mile per hour from their planes. Recipes for exotic fuel mixtures for every flying condition are used as necessary. Once the plane is ready to make a run for the roses, it must be started by an inertia starter with a hand crank geared to a flywheel or an electric starter. Assistance in starting is needed because the engines are tuned to give maximum power and to turn small high pitch props at maximum RPM. Consequently, they are difficult to start by hand. Once the engines fire to life, things get as busy as a beehive in July. Now the race is to the quickest, for the only thing judged here is top miles per hour for the day, and out on the central pivotal pole, the three elements of plane, pilot, and preparation will determine who is the number one merchant of zip. At the other end of the scale from speed flying is scale flying. The emphasis here is on reality, and some of these modelers have come so close to the ideal of building a miniature that is a perfect copy of the full-size airplane that they deserve to be called the magic makers. Everyone enjoys seeing a beautifully built replica of a full-size ship. With the materials and technology available to today's modelers, there is no limit to the wonders they can work. Oftentimes, without a frame of reference to guide the eye, these mini marvels could easily be mistaken for the real thing. 
In competition, points are awarded for how closely a model resembles its full-scale counterpart in both appearance and flying quality. Areas of appearance that are judged are the fuselage, wing, tail surfaces, landing gear, engine, cowling and propeller, finish, color, and markings. But none of that matters if it won't fly. The model must remain continuously airborne for 10 or more consecutive laps in order to obtain flight points. Unfortunately, one of the prime problems with scale models is that they are often overweight because the modeler has tried to add too many details. Sometimes the results can be a trifle embarrassing. Sometimes all it takes is a few minor adjustments and then off we go into the wild blue yonder. There's always the old kangaroo jet imitation, of course. In the end, performances like these are best kept under wraps. For every model that does not succeed in flight, there are many that do. Some of these unique little beauties are equipped with control line operated features that boggle the mind as well as earn points for their flyers. Such features include multi-engines, retractable landing gear, flaps that lower and raise, running lights that turn on and off, and bomb bay doors that open and drop bombs or parachutes. These are but a few of the operational options that the magic makers include in their quest for perfection. When speaking of control line, there are two elements unique to scale that must not be overlooked. They are time and courage. When someone invests hundreds or even thousands of hours of their time in building a scale replica, it requires a certain amount of courage to take that plane out and fly it. Although no one likes to think about it, a freak accident can wipe out weeks or months of hard work. On the other hand, when the sky is a windless, radiant blue, the engine is humming, the lines are gleaming taut in silver in the sun, and all systems are go, then there are few finer moments in any hobby or sport. And if, as an added bonus, the judges mark the flyer as a winner, he'll have had the kind of day that all the magic makers dream of. A day that was truly one to remember. Few events in control line flying are more exciting than racing. Among its categories are Rat and Goodyear or Scale Racing. These are events that offer a challenge to both the pilot and his crew members. They are team competition events in which the planes reach speeds of up to 150 or more miles per hour. The common element of racing events is to fly two planes in the same circle for a specified number of laps. 
Le Mans, a cold starts are used to begin the races. Then each model is timed from the common starting signal until it completes the specified laps. The time is recorded as the official score. What makes these events somewhat tricky is that there are a certain number of pit stops specified. The model must make the required number of pit stops before the completion of the laps or be disqualified. As the clock ticks off the seconds and the judge ticks off the laps, it becomes quite evident why these pilots could be called the circle dancers. The basic flying procedure of racing events is to start as quickly as possible, fly fast, refuel, and restart in the shortest amount of time. Speed and efficiency in the racing events can be increased through the practice and use of various techniques devised by each individual flyer and his crew member. It is possible to start the plane's engine with one flip of the propeller, and many times a pit stop by an experienced team will last only four or five seconds. of a hot glove is essential. The hot glove consists of a pair of contacts on the crew member's fingers, which are connected to a battery. When the crew member grasps the plane with his hand, instant contact is made with the glow plug. Then, when the engine starts, he merely releases his hand and the plane is launched with no wasted motion. In the racing events, it takes much practice to have the winning edge. And while the steel wires binding pilot and plane are of great importance, the coordination between the pilot and his crew member is of paramount importance. For it is here where seconds are gained or lost that races are won or lost. While the main theme of the racing events is the sheer excitement of competition and speed, there is an underlying secondary theme that is partly ballet and partly a steady hypnotic rhythm that insinuates itself on the senses as the circle dances pirouette gracefully around and around, oblivious for the moment to others outside their own circular universe. While some are dancers, others are fighters. The event is combat flying and each pilot brings to it a squadron of planes because the mortality rate runs high. The purpose of this category is to simulate an aircraft dogfight between two opposing pilots. It's a wild and woolly event full of exciting good times. And if a flyer is adept enough he may find himself stepping into the combat circle as one of the ace makers. The planes for this event are a very basic design, simple and quick to build because many of them will see only one flight. But they must also be constructed strong enough to withstand the high loads imposed by tight maneuvering. The chief aim in combat flying is the destruction of a streamer tied to the tail of each plane. 
the streamer is 10 feet long and is tied to the plane with a strong leader six feet long. There are no restrictions on the airplane design except that it must be for two lines which are 60 feet in length. A contestant is allowed only one plane and one set of lines per match. There is a time limit of five minutes for each match, beginning from the starting signal. 100 points are scored each time the streamer is cut. The planes may land for refueling and restarting at any time during the match. The ideal combat plane must be highly maneuverable, rugged, and have a high speed potential. The prime requirement is maneuverability because the plane has to be able to turn on a dime in order to win or survive. While there are a few ways to win a match, this is not one of them. Mid-air collisions are not uncommon, and when debris rains from the sky like this, you can be sure that neither plane will fly again. Every good combat flyer must be a master of all the basic flying maneuvers. And shades of Baron von Richthofen and Pappy Boeing. Control line combat pilots also need to have a steady hand, cobra quick reflexes, and nerves as well as wires of steel. No small skill involved in whipping these speedsters through the skies at a breakneck pace. Clean kills are not common, and any ace maker who is agile enough to slice another streamer is to be commended. Sometimes what transpires on the ground is as frantic as what takes place aloft. Consequently, there are stringent rules against unsportsmanlike conduct, such as tripping, holding, biting and fisticuffs, all of which result in disqualification. With two skilled pilots working the wires, a combat match can be as exciting a spectacle as exists in the sport of model flying. In elimination combat, contestants are matched in pairs. The winner of each match advances to the next round. At one time, inverted flying was banned and a courtesy lap was required after takeoff. Now, it's no holds barred where flying maneuvers are concerned. However, as a safety measure, the first aircraft up must maintain at least a 15-foot altitude until the second plane is launched. Once both planes are in the air, the rules of war prevail. If a downed pilot can get his craft flying again, he should try to do so if the plane is flyable. Since one point is given for each second of airtime, the content of the flying is far more important than the form. Sometimes a flight ends on a wing and a prayer, and at other times 
it can be a total disaster in which a plane from a flyer squadron is irretrievably lost. In direct opposition to those long moments of loss, there comes sometimes a victory so quick and sweet that all past failures evaporate from the memory like mist before the wind. This is the moment of the ace maker. These moments are not only what combat control line is all about, but they are what all phases of control line flying are about. Truly, this is a sport that has its ups and downs, and it's around and around. It's a sport anyone is free to enjoy, because all it takes is a plane, a couple of steel threads, and a flyer who's ready to get out among his friends where he can be wired for excitement.